This is video number seven of the Aggregate Demand and Aggregate Supply series, which is unit 2.2 of the IB Macroeconomic Syllabus. In this video, I'm going to introduce and explain alternative views of long-run aggregate supply, LRAS. So in the previous video, I introduced short-run aggregate supply. In this video, I'm going to introduce and explain the alternative views and how there are groups of economists that disagree. So let's move on to the learning objectives. The learning outcomes for this specific video are, number one, to explain using a diagram that the monetarist or new classical model of the long-run aggregate supply curve is vertical at the level of potential output. This will all make sense when I explain it. And then we're going to explain using a diagram that the Keynesian model of the aggregate supply has three sections because of wage price downward inflexibility. If these don't make much sense right now, don't worry, I'm just introducing them. You'll get. So basically, you'll get what they mean in a minute. We're going to look at the monetarist new classical model as well as the Keynesian model of the aggregate supply curve. Let's see what this whole debate is about. So essentially, this video is, um, I, I like, when I introduce this lesson to my students, I like to tell them that this um, concept, the concept of long-run aggregate supply, is really a concept of a battle of the economists. There are, now this is oversimplifying the battle. There are many, many different economists with many different views, but the, it, we can kind of group many of them in one of two sides. There are the supply side economists, and there are the demand side economists. Supply side economists uh, are often referred to as the monetarist or the new classical school of thought. They believe that supply creates its own demand so that um, the economy needs to produce and ne there needs to be aggregate supply and that will create the aggregate demand. They believe in efficiency of market forces and therefore they believe governments should not intervene in the allocation of resources in the economy, but rather governments should only create the conditions for markets to operate freely and efficiently. They are not proponents or advocates of government intervention in the economy. What about the demand side of eco economists? Um, they are known as the Keynesian school of thought because um, uh, one of the most influential demand side economists was John Maynard Keynes. They believe the opposite. Demand creates its own supply. Notice how different those beliefs are. They believe that governments should intervene in the allocation of resources in the economy to affect aggregate demand. And this is to help smooth out short-term fluctuations in economic activity. So they believe that all economies fluctuate in the short run. And to smooth out these fluctuations, governments have to intervene in the allocation of resources to affect aggregate demand. So that's broadly speaking and oversimplifying. There are the supply side economists, known as the monetarist or the new classical school of thought, and the demand side economists, um, known as the Keynesian school of thought. So what do the uh, monetarists or the new classical economists believe? What is the model that they propose for long-run aggregate supply? Well, they propose that long-run aggregate supply, LRAS, is a vertical curve at the level of potential output, the full employment level of output, because aggregate supply in the long run is independent of the price level. So they believe that once the economy reaches full employment, um, which is here, YFE, full employment, the long-run aggregate supply curve is vertical, okay? The long-run aggregate supply curve is perfectly inelastic. It is independent of the average price level. Remember, YFE here stands for full employment level of output or the potential output of the economy. This model is sometimes called the flexible wage model because they believe that in the long run, Wages and prices are flexible and they should adjust and always bring the economy back to its long run uh, equilibrium, which is the full employment level of output. This is called the flexible wage model. Um, remember, these economists don't necessarily disagree uh, on the shape of the short run aggregate supply curve. So the short run aggregate supply curve in this model is a regular upward sloping supply curve. It's the long run aggregate supply curve that they believe 
is a vertical inelastic curve that is independent of the price level. And that's because wages and prices are flexible in the long run and they should adjust automatically and bring the economy um, to its long run equilibrium or the full employment level of output. Uh, so let's elaborate um, a bit more. So the Keynesians believe that this um, long-run aggregate supply curve represents the potential output that could be produced if the economy was operating at full capacity. Uh, full employment, remember, doesn't necessarily mean, it does not mean that there is zero unemployment. When economists talk about full employment, they do believe that certain types of unemployment still exist, even when the economy is at full employment level. There's like seasonal unemployment uh, or frictional unemployment. You'll find out what these mean when we discuss unemployment in one of the future lessons. But remember, full employment level of output doesn't mean there's zero unemployment, but it means that there's no spare capacity in the economy. They believe that wages and prices are fully flexible and will adjust freely. Any attempt to change aggregate demand by the government will only affect the price level and therefore not the level of real GDP. So, say for example, if this is the aggregate demand curve here, AD, and the government tries to increase aggregate demand and it rises to AD1, guess what? Because the economy in the long run is at full employment, this will not affect the real output. It will only cause the average price level to rise. So they assert that the potential output is based entirely on the quantity and quality, and hence the productivity, of the factors of production and not on the price level. Okay? So they believe that the only way long-run aggregate supply or the full employment level of output is determined is by the quantity and quality and the productivity of the factors of production and not the price level. Keynesians, on the other hand, or Keynesians or Keynesians, God, I've seen so many economics videos and different people pronounce it differently. So I'll just say Keynesians because, you know, they follow John Maynard Keynes. They have proposed an alternative model, which is sometimes known as the sticky wage model. The Keynesian model of aggregate supply has three sections because they believe there is wage price downward in flexibility and different levels of spare capacity in the economy. Okay, so as you can see, the Keynesian aggregate supply curve looks very different um, to the uh, monetarist or new classical aggregate supply model. We can divide it into three sections. So let's begin with section one. Section one, uh, so first of all, the Keynesian model does not distinguish really between the short run and the long run. This is important. Um, they believe more in different levels of spare capacity, but they don't really distinguish much between the short run and the long run. They believe that the aggregate supply curve will be perfectly elastic at low levels of economic activity because of wage price downward inflexibility. Okay? Workers will not accept cuts in their wages, and prices are very sticky downwards. Prices usually go up, but they rarely go down in an economy because of this downward inflexibility. Uh, wages and prices are sticky, and when times are bad, firms are more likely to fire workers rather than cut their wages, and they're less likely to actually cut prices. So producers in the economy, because um, if the economy is operating in section one, producers in the economy can raise their levels of output without incurring higher average costs because of the existence of their spare capacity. Um, when there is spare capacity in section one, which is this section here that this is what I'm talking about right now, there are high levels of unused factors of production, such as unemployed labor and underutilized capital. Should there be an, a need for greater output, they can, th these can be used at their fullest capacity at constant average costs, which means that if the economy is operating in section one, any increase in aggregate demand will not affect the price level. It will lead to an increase in real output in, in the, the level of output of the economy without leading to a rise in the average price level. And this is in section one, when there is a lot of spare capacity and because of the downward inflexibility of wages and prices. What about section two? So section two here, what's happening is the economy is slowly starting to approach its full employment level of output. It hasn't yet arrived at full employment, but it's approaching. 
In section two, as you are approaching full employment level of output, there's much less spare capacity. Okay, the economy is approaching full employment, but it hasn't yet gotten there. It hasn't yet arrived at full employment. If firms, if you are operating in section two, if the aggregate demand curve intersects somewhere in section two, if the firms want to increase aggregate supply, they would have to bid for scarcer resources, and so the costs of production begin to rise. Firms will pass these higher costs onto the consumers in the form of higher prices. So this is in section two. As the economy is approaching full employment, but not quite at full employment yet, um, any increase in aggregate demand will lead to competing for scarcer resources and therefore will begin to push the cost of production and hence the average price level um, higher. It will bid the prices and the average price level will start to rise. Now, what about section three? Okay, as you can see, this is the vertical section of the um, Keynesian aggregate supply curve. This is when the economy has reached full employment. Okay, so once the economy reaches its full employment level, the economy has reached its productive capacity. There is no more spare capacity. The economy is producing at YFE, which is the full employment level of output. Any further increases in aggregate demand at this point will only lead to inflation and hence a rise in the general price level. So they do agree with the monetarists that once the economy reaches full employment, any increase in aggregate demand will be inflationary, will only lead to a rise in the average price level without an increase in um, uh, real output. However, they disagree that if there is spare capacity in the economy, increases in aggregate demand could increase, if you're operating in section one, they could increase real output without causing any inflation. If you're operating in section two, they could increase real output without much inflation. There might be some inflation, but once you approach full employment, any further increases in aggregate demand will just be inflationary and will lead to a rise in the general or the average price level. So there are three sections in the Keynesian aggregate supply curve depending on the level of spare capacity. And remember, they believe that wages and prices can generally rise, but they are downwardly inflexible. Wages and prices are sticky and they rarely go down in reality because firms are less likely to lower prices and they're more likely to fire workers instead of cutting um, their existing wages, because that might be demotivating for the workers they already have employed. So remember, um, unlike the monetarist uh, new classical model, where monetarists claim that wages and prices are flexible and they will go up or go down to adjust and bring the economy to its long-run equilibrium, Keynesians believe that, no, prices and wages are likely to go up, but they're very unlikely to go down. They are downwardly inflexible. And hence, they divide the aggregate supply curve to three sections based on the level of spare capacity and how close you are or far away the economy is from full employment level of output. So just a quick sum up, and I'm sorry if this is repetitive, but this can be one of the tricky ones. So um, section um, I, there's high unemployment. Firms would rather fire workers than cut wages, and there's lots of spare capacity. So aggregate demand can increase in this region without causing the price level to rise. Okay? In section 2, there's much less spare capacity, but there's still some spare capacity. The economy is approaching full employment. Wages and other costs start to rise, because remember, firms and are, like, are, are more likely to raise uh, wages and prices than they are to cut them. So as you're approaching full employment, wages and prices start to rise, and so the average price level starts to rise. In section three of the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, there's no spare capacity. The economy has reached full employment, and any further increase in aggregate demand will just cause inflation and a rise in the average price level. So these are, these are the three sections in the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. So, a lot of my students ask me, Mr. Elashiri, which side is, tr is, you know, tells the truth? Which side is correct? Well, it doesn't, I think both 
schools of thought have their merits but also have their disadvantages. And many mainstream economists, so many modern economists, they take a Keynesian perspective which emphasizes the importance of aggregate demand for the short run. They agree that in the short run, aggregate demand is important and the government should interfere to affect aggregate demand if, there is, if the economy is operating below full employment and their spare capacity. But they also adopt the neoclassical perspective, which emphasizes the importance of aggregate supply for the long run. So many mainstream economists sort of um, uh, take a compromise between both schools of thought. They take a Keynesian perspective that emphasizes the importance of aggregate demand for the short run, and a neoclassical um, or monetarist perspective that emphasizes the importance of aggregate supply for the long run. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.